Thank you very much. Um, I do a lot of talking, but uh, I've, I mean, it's so humbling to be here in front of so many people who have travelled so far um, for this forum. And I just hope I don't say the wrong things or disappoint you or get the level wrong. Um, it's a really hard talk to give because you've all got different experiences and um, different things you know. So, so m many of you know far more than I'm going to talk about. In preparing this talk, I, re I really think it's good to understand as much as you can about your disease and, and what we talk about in the laboratory and some of the jargon we use. So I'm going right back to basics. So uh, uh, apologies if it's too basic, um, but we'll get there. And I want to start with a bit of history. It's sort of fun for me. And I think it's good to reflect on, in a sense, how, how lucky we are knowing that we're not nearly lucky enough. But we've come an awful long way. We've come an awful long way in the laboratory in the last 50, 60 years. And similarly, while I'm talking a bit about history, we've come so, so far in terms of treatment of all the blood disorders that we have. So we're, we're very lucky to be where we are, but not nearly lucky enough. I mean, we have so far to go, as, as you all know. But it's, it's important to reflect of how far we've actually come and, and how much better the treatments are. So back in the lab in the 60s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, um, there might be someone would come in and say, well, we've got a blood sample today from the surgical ward. They'd be smoking in the lab, of course, and, and uh, so I'll get on to it after lunch, perhaps. And everything was done one, one sample at a time um, by manual pipetting, by mouth pipetting. So we'd suck up, well, not me, but suck up with your mouth, take out a certain amount of blood, and do the, prepara do the preparations. And the cells were counted individually, so this is what we call a counting chamber. We still do this in our research laboratory, but not diagnostically. So if you wanted a red cell count or a white cell count, you had to dilute the blood and put it on this counting chamber and count with a little clicker um, the number of cells. Recently, we were, we were um, tidying up the basement and found some old reports. So this is... Taylor, the patient's name is Taylor, I don't know if it's Mr. or Mrs. Taylor, in 1947, and this is a blood count at the time. So we've got a red cell count and a haemoglobin, and that was the blood count. It was taken on the 30th of September and reported two days later, so you can give some idea of the turnaround time and the detail that's in there. And then, of course, patient identification is abysmal, so I've, you know, I, haven't, I haven't covered anything up. Uh, because there is nothing to cover up. <laughs> I don't know the date of birth or the first name or anything. So, so we've come a long, long way. This one, they asked for a bit more detail. So they got a white cell count and uh, the differential, we call it those, the different types of white cells, which are so critically important that we differentiate. So this is Mrs. Reeves. So we know we've have the number of Reeves it might be, but I, I'm not violating any confidentiality again because we have no idea which Reeves this is. We, we, things advanced a bit and, and they wanted to be more efficient than typing out each one, so the person who requested it had to do the carbon copy request and then that would be typed on. You can't read it, can you, but it doesn't really say anything very useful. Uh, it's, but it's got the white count, and they would have asked for the platelet count. They specifically, as you can see there in the request, asked for a platelet count, though, so that was a bit special to get that. Um, so we've come an awful long way since, since those bad old days, in a sense. So now, 2018, you've come along to your day unit, the chemotherapy unit or whatever, and you can, you can turn up just before your chemotherapy with a bit of, or you can, if, if it's in the right place and that your sample's bled and it's taken to the lab, put onto the lab system if it's not already on it, and brought to haematology. Um, you know, we do this in Dunedin, we do it a thousand times a day, so it's not like one in the afternoon. We don't smoke in the lab anymore. <laughs> so, so there might be, and it's uh, sometimes, uh, for, for you guys, it's a bit like a fish and chip shop, so there's an urgent from oncology or whatever, um, you know, they bring it in, urgent order. Most stuff is routine, but if it's an emergency department or somewhere where it needs it fast, someone says urgent sample. And that goes straight on to our haematology analyzer. So there's two side by side. These are our analyzers, very expensive bits of kit. So there's actually two in parallel. We put it on there, and 90 seconds later, the result will be finding its way down to the, the doctor's computer system. So it's extraordinarily fast. Now, I've, we've opened the um, 
open the door on it and I'll show you sort of what, what happens. Not that it's very exciting, but so it mixes the sample. Make sure everything's properly mixed, which used to be a problem when I started in the lab. I gave you terrible results. And then it, it automatically, uh, or reading the barcode to make sure we've got the right person, and then it takes a sample. It only takes about three drops of blood. So it's taking a sample. So, why do you take so much off? Yeah, yeah, all right. Because <laughs> occasionally we use occasionally we use um, more than more than that but um, so there we are it's all finished I think it's, it's nearly all finished there so it's it's really quick and it automatically does everything so we're through now it gives lots of really detailed information that our technologists the scientists in the lab look at so for example we can see the size of the red cells and the distribution of size we see the platelets and the distribution and we look at the white cells and i'll show you that in a bit more detail here so the machine automatically figures out which are neutrophils and lymphocytes and monocytes and eosinophils and basophils it does that with incredible accuracy and it counts a lot, lot more cells than we would if we did it ourselves. So most of the time it's really accurate. Although, talking to you guys, I think for many of you, um, we'll be sitting down the microscope and looking at them individually because you, between you have some pretty unusual looking cells that the machine might not cope with so well. So the results are, checked automatically and if your results are completely normal so i guess i should be talking to a different audience there but if they are normal they're automatically down and and everything's right about the quality control so quality control is a huge issue but if everything's right they're automatically downloaded into the doctor's computer system and we don't even don't even see them we don't even blink if our computer says they're not normal, then the computer does a bit more thinking and we so it does some things automatically um, according to the rules that we set. So it might send out the results and say, this is okay, it's abnormal, but it's okay. Or it might say, hold on, you guys, you experts need to review it. So that's where our technologists come in and they look at it, they look at your, they're, they're looking at a lot of information. Um, they're looking at the request form to see what information was on there about your condition. And they're deciding either to add a comment or to look in more detail at the blood film. So just, um, very briefly in passing. You know, they see a lot of information at their screen and a lot of the work they're doing is at the computer screen, reviewing all the details that, that you don't see on the final report. So let's, I just wanted to take an example. Ex example I, um, was a real case when I first uh, wrote this talk. What we're trying to do when when we get a sample in from your doctor is to answer your doctor's question. It's like a, a, it's like a consult, you know, he sends you along to a surgeon, so what do you think? Sends a blood sample to us, what do you think? And so we particularly like it if the doctor says, I've got a problem, you know, what's the answer? So this problem here, 50 year old came to the emergency department with back pain, so it must have been quite severe back pain, and we get a blood count in, and the haemoglobin's 100, so the patient's anemic, that's not right. We look at the size of the cells. When, when someone's anemic, I look at the size of the cells, and we know that how big the, the average cell size, the so mean cell volume or mean corpuscular volume, and it's 99, and they're a little bit big, but a little bit's enough for me. So we say this is macrocytic, big cells, anemia. Neutrophils are normal, platelets are normal, but a macrocytic anemia is not right, and we need to figure that out. So it needs to be reviewed. We need to look at a blood film. So a technologist starts and they look at the blood films. Um, they'll spend several minutes, maybe a lot longer if they need to, looking at the blood film. So um, that's what a blood film looks like. We take a drop of blood. It's again done on a fancy machine now. Take a drop of blood, spread it out, and so we could look at the cells individually down the microscope. So here's Leah looking at the blood film. Um, and they would look about look at about 10 percent. Sorry, of all the samples that come into the laboratory, we make blood films in about 10 percent of the time. So don't assume we've looked at your blood each time. And you, maybe your doctor sometimes does. So if, if, if there's something that doesn't add up, make sure we have actually looked at the blood. We, I think we do it 99.9 percent .9 of the time when we need to, but there'll be occasions when we 
miss it. So we look down at the blood, and here's the example of, of this particular case. I don't know if anyone can pick the abnormality, but the, the red cells are lined up a bit more than they should be. It's what we call rouleau. They're all lined up, sort of stacked up together, side by side by side, sticking together a bit. And that's not right. They should look like this. So this is what normal red cells look like. Now red cells, I, I call them red cells. You can call them red blood cells. If we're being professional, we call them erythrocytes. Red corpuscles, Americans like to call them corpuscles, don't they, I think? It's a historical word, but I stick with as short as possible, red cells. And that's what they look like on the blood film. And then I'm also showing you platelets. So platelets, they're the ones that they get beaten around a lot in chemotherapy and you run out and you get your bruising. Men like platelets because when we cut ourselves shaving, they come to the rescue and plug up the little holes, don't they? I mean, we all need platelets, of course, but they plug up little damaged vessels. So they're tiny little cells. So if you've got polycythemia vera, you've got too many red cells. Your bone marrow is producing too many of those red cells. They're pretty normal looking red cells, just far too many of them. Maybe if you've got essential thrombocythemia, your bone marrow is producing too many of the platelets. Just too many. Then we look at the, what we call the leukocytes. I don't like this expression. Leukocytes means white cells. I call them purple cells because that's what they look like. And these are the purple cells. So I'm not, when we start to look at the purple cells, we, we sort of ignore the red cells around them. Okay. So on the left, we've got a neutrophil, and I'll explain some of these in a bit more detail. Neutrophil, eosinophil, they're very pretty. We don't, uh, some of you will have disorders that involve eosinophils. Most of the time, they're not involved in blood cancer. The most common would be worms, if you've got in parasites or allergy or something like that. Um, they, they do go up in some of the blood cancers. Monocytes are really important for us in our immune system, and then lymphocytes, which is a little guy on the right. So if you've got chronic lymphocytic leukemia, you've got too many lymphocytes, lymphocytic leukemia, and they look pretty much just like those lymphocytes. There's just too many of them, and too many of anything is just not, not right. So they're, they're not terribly abnormal, just too many. So neutrophils, we need neutrophils because they eat things, they eat bugs. So they've got our, a normal neutrophil on the left, and in the middle is a neutrophil that's eaten some of the meningococcus, which is a meningitis bug. And we don't see this very often. Of course, it happens if you get, you know, if you get a pimple or something, if you're back in those teenage years, if you get a pimple, I'm sure they look like that in your pimple, or you get pneumonia inside your lungs, they're eating the bugs in there. We don't normally see it in the bloodstream. So we don't expect to see bugs like this in the bloodstream. This is from a little girl who got meningitis earlier this year, terrible meningitis. And I'm pleased to say she's back at school, which is fantastic. So normally when we see it, it's a terrible thing. The next, so, but it illustrates what neutrophils are doing, and that's why you need neutrophils, and that's why we all get a bit anxious when your neutrophil count goes low after chemotherapy. The next one's just pretty because we wouldn't see this, it'd be very unusual, but it's a neutrophil that's eaten some yeast particles, just to demonstrate what they do. Monocytes. Monocytes grow up to be what we call macrophages, so they're eating cells as well. So they're pretty related, they're very similar in some ways to neutrophils. So just some pictures so you can see what they're eating. The one on the left, fancy picture of it eating tuberculosis. The one on the middle is, is in a form of tuberculosis where the, that big cell's eating the, the cells. And then often um, macrophages or monocytes are really good at just cleaning up the damage, cleaning up the mess. So the one on the right is in the bone marrow and that's what we might see after you've had your chemotherapy. So chemotherapy, we kill a lot of cells, someone's got to mop it up and the macrophages come up and eat the cells. And in that particular case, it's a really pretty blue colour. Um, so so that gives you some idea what they're doing. Lymphocytes. So this is, lymphocyte development's really important. So a lymphocyte, when it's born in the bone marrow, is called a lymphoblast. It's a really immature lymphocyte. It's not yet a lymphocyte, it's just sort of a baby. And it grows up to become a mature lymphocyte. So we go from a blast 
to Olympus site. And that's the guy that helps fight infection. I mean, your whole immune system, maybe it fight, particularly fights viral infection. That's particularly important if you don't have enough lymphocytes. And if the lymphocyte has been challenged and it's done its job, it's been to war and it's fought off, a, fought off some sort of infection, then some of those will go on to become plasma cells to make your antibodies to keep your immune system going and protect you from the, in the future when you get that same virus or whatever it is. So our plasma cell on the right there, they make antibodies, and we all have millions of those making millions of different antibodies to protect us in our immune system. If you've got too many lymphoblasts, I mean far, far too many lymphoblasts, that corresponds to acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. So that's the one that children typically get. If children get leukaemia, it's usually acute lymphoblastic, although adults can get it as well. I've talked about chronic lymphocytic leukemia, if you've got too many of those cells, and if you've got too many plasma cells or a cancer of plasma cells. It's not just, I'm being a bit simplistic, aren't I? Too many, it's not just too many, it's a cancer of and too many. Then that's what we call myeloma. So let's come back, we've looked at the blood film, we've deviated a bit, let's come back to this patient, the 50 year old patient who's got a macrocytic anemia. So in the lab we've got a question, why does this patient have a macrocytic anemia? And so the technologists will be scratching their heads and thinking, what are all the causes of macrocytic anemia? And they have their, these in their head, they're thinking about it all the time. And here's some of the, the list, maybe they're drinking too much alcohol, maybe they've got bad liver disease, maybe they're deficient in B12 or folate, maybe they've got lots of young immature cells called reticular sites, maybe they're on some drugs. Maybe they've got myelodysplastic syndrome. Small print, maybe myeloma. And the small print continues. So our technologists would look at those results. They would look at all the previous results and say, how long has this patient had macrocytic anemia for? Did this just happen in the last few weeks? Do we have previous results? Was it normal previously? So some idea of how quickly this has happened, whether it's new, whether it's acute, whether this is chronic, if there's some pattern. And they will check all the other results from the laboratory. They'll check the liver results. Um, they'll check to see if someone's looked for the B12 or the folate result. Um, they might look at the, the bilirubin to see if it's someone's got a hemolytic state which are, or destroying their blood cells. Maybe look at their globulin levels. So let's look at some of the examples. Maybe think, oh, well, could this be alcohol? Because drinking too much alcohol um, is one of the most common reasons why you might have big red cells. So sometimes if you drink too much alcohol or you've got liver disease, you get what we call target cells. So the red cells there on the top left look like a target. Sometimes in the same, if you drink too much alcohol, they look like mouth, a mouth, like a stoma. Stoma is a word for a mouth. Stomach, um, stomach's a mouth of the gut. Did you know that? So it looks like, a, and we call it a stomatocyte, a mouth cell. So we'll look for those. If, they've got, if you've got a deficiency of vitamin B12 or folic acid, then there's certain characteristics. So the cells are particularly big and they're oval and they look a bit different. And when we look at the neutrophils, the neutrophils sometimes have lots of lobes. Instead of having three or four, they've got more than five lobes. So they'll be looking for that. They're looking for the young cells, what we call the reticular sites, which are young red cells. And on the top image there, you can see two of those cells are bluish in colour, slightly bluer than the others, and they're big. So when our marrow makes new cells, those new cells are bigger, bigger than our old cells. So that's one of the causes. They're thinking about myelodysplastic syndrome, especially if the patient's over 60 or 70. Thinking of their odd cells in there. Myelodysplasia is just Greek for odd-looking cells. And some of the odd cells that we see, the one on the left is a neutrophil that looks like the old-style spectacles, you know, the pince-nez spectacles that people used to wear. That makes the diagnosis easy if we see those. So we don't always see, we don't always see that. We don't see in myelodysplasia, it's a bit of a mixed bag, so we don't always see something specific. The one on the right, you can see um, one of those, you've got a big red cell that's completely full of haemoglobin. That's what red cells carry, of course. And the one next to it is pretty much empty, like a bicycle rim. 
That's not right. The patient doesn't have iron deficiency, and that's one of the signs we see in myelodysplastic syndrome. There's two different populations, so we watch that very carefully in an older person with macrocytic big cells. One of the questions, could it be myeloma? Myeloma, you have lots of protein in the blood, often, not always. And that causes the cells to sort of stack up. We call that rouleau. Rouleau is like a cooking term, isn't it? Cooking. Is that for rolling up your... I don't know, that doesn't make sense. I've, someone will have to help me on rouleau later, maybe at morning tea. <laughs> um, but they stack up. And we think, that's not right. Is there too much protein? And then one of the reasons why you'd have too much protein would be myeloma. It's not the only reason. And then sometimes, whenever we worry about myeloma or think about myeloma, we look for the plasma cells in the blood, and we don't normally see them, but sometimes you do. And so that's a, a cell that looks a bit like a plasma cell. I think that's not quite right. So this, this patient did have that. So if the technologist sees something that they is significant, or they don't like or they don't understand, then that would come to me or one of the other laboratory haematologists. So in this particular case, the blood film or blood smear um, showed some plasma cells. The patient had a macrocytic anemia. Um, the renal function, the kidney function had been done and the creatinine was high, so that's not good. And the immunoglobulin levels, we, we added that in the lab. So a good lab will add extra things as they need to. And that showed that the immune system was suppressed. So the question was, was this myeloma as it turned out to be? So the technologist would give this, the, the blood film to me or to the other laboratory haematologist and we would look in far more detail, look at everything we can, try and put the whole picture together and make a very clear recommendation, which is that this patient may well, or you know, myeloma should be considered and should be referred to haematology and list the different tests that we've actually added on to help make that diagnosis. Now she needs, a, she needs a marrow biopsy, a bone marrow biopsy, so I'm going to talk about this for a little bit, I think, soon. So sometimes we see plasma cells in the bloodstream, as there's not many, so this is the case where the, those quite big cells are actually plasma cells. It's unusual to see that in myeloma, but sometimes we do. What else do we see? Just to, just to share some of the language. So I've shown you that the, the neutrophils that look like spectacles, so they're called pseudopalga Hewitt. You might have seen that on a report somewhere. I hope not, but you might have um, neutrophils, and that's what we see sometimes in myelodysplastic syndrome. The guy in the middle is a myeloblast. Now, and a blast is a dirty word for some of you. Um, so a blast is a normal, immature cell, the first, sort of the most immature of the cells that we can see in development of a lymphocyte or the development of a neutrophil. But in your context, it's usually a leukemia cell. So a myeloblast in the middle, that's what it looks like. It's a, or they, look, they all look a little bit different, but they're a big cell. They've got a big nucleus, and when I look at that nucleus, I say that's a pretty young, immature nucleus. The one on the right is another myeloblast, and it's got this interesting feature in the... Sorry, I just... Let's go back to this, the left-hand side. In the cell, so I'm making some assumptions, the, bit, the, the dark purple bit in the middle is the nucleus. That's where all the DNA is. And around the outside is the cytoplasm. So I sort of forget that I think take that automatically. So on the one on the right now, that's got this big nucleus, a dark purple occupies most of the area. And then it just there, there's a little crystal thing. It looks like a red crystal. And that is a crystal. And it's a, it's, we call it an hour rod. And that means we can make a diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia with confidence. Now, most patients with acute myeloid leukemia don't have it, but if we do see it, we make a diagnosis almost instantaneously. Lymphocytes and lymphoblasts. There's a nice normal lymphocyte on the left and a lymphoblast in the middle. And you say, well, they look the same to me. And if I was to shrink it down, they do look pretty similar, don't they? There's not a lot of difference. So the key thing is the size. OK, 
okay? The lymphocyte is just a little bit bigger than a red cell, not much. And its nucleus is different. It's like, I sort of use the salami analogies a lot. It's like, sort of like a chorizo salami. You know how you've got the little bits of meat and fat, the, the, the texture to it. Whereas the lymphoblast in the middle, the, the nucleus is sort of a bit like luncheon sausage, isn't it? Belgium, we call it in Invercargill. And it's, it's more uniform and homogeneous. So those, we get, we, our eyes get very fine-tuned into those sort of details. So the, the lymphoblast in the middle, which is in the blood, so that doesn't belong there, so that's not nice, is a big, big cell. Um, it's all nucleus, and it's an immature nucleus. And there's another lymphoblast there. So for those of you who have experienced with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that's what we're, they're the blasts that we're looking for, and to you, they're nasty cells. Um, but most of the time, and, you know, they can be normal cells as well. Some other cells that we might see, hairy cell leukemia, it's not a very common type of leukemia or lymphoma, but some of you may have it. Um, and we, I sort of have to admit, we enjoy seeing them in the laboratory. There's the, the, I, I, I suppose I have to come clean here. There is a, dis we have two, there's sort of two entities when you're in the laboratory, and one is a case and one is a person. And they're very distinct entities. So the case can be very interesting, and then we, in a, in a split second later, we're thinking about the person who has the case. Do you see what I mean? There's a case, we make a diagnosis, we put our intellect to making an accurate diagnosis, we do all sorts of clever stuff. We make a diagnosis, we might be really pleased because it's a really unusual or interesting or pretty diagnosis, and then a split second later, we're thinking, hold on, that's you know a 40-year-old who's got a family and so on. So there's two, there's two entities. And excuse me if I inappropriately um, shift from one to the other because here it's all about you and you as a people and how it's affecting you. The one in the middle um, is the sort of cell we see in, in some lymphoma, follicular lymphoma. So lymphoma, there's sort of lumps of lymphocytes and they usually stay in your lymph nodes, lymphoid tissue, spleen, liver, lymph nodes. But sometimes, some of them we see in the blood, which is not a surprise, because lymphocytes are like scouts. They're going around the body all the time. They're immune cells. They're looking for trouble. They're looking for something to react against. So they do travel around. We know that. If they're in one part of the body, we know we'll find them in another part of the body. And sometimes we see them in the bloodstream. So it's not a bad sign, particularly. It's just they're doing what lymphocytes like to do, which is to check out, their, check out what they're protecting, they're, you know, they're a part of the immune system. This follicular lymphoma, lymphocyte, you see has got a sort of cleft down the middle, which is quite characteristic. And then this big one on the right is from a mantle cell lymphoma. They all look a bit different, but this has got a different sort of cleft in it, and it's a bigger cell. So we get used to those. So maybe you need a bone marrow biopsy. So you're lying there comfortably, no, uncomfortably. I have never, no, no, I have occasionally met a patient who, on the bed who slept well the night before, but most, most of you will come in, you haven't slept well, you maybe didn't get a wink of sleep at all. It's a source of anxiety for obvious reasons. So there you are lying on the bed, and I like to show the pelvis on the, it's an MRI or CT scan, sorry, image. So I put, people do it differently. I get people to go into the recovery position. Now, different hematologists do it differently. I love the recovery position because when you're in that position, in a nice sleeping position, this is not a fetal position, I don't like that, but some people do. Um, in that position, you're, the side of your pelvis has been rocked around so it's horizontal. And so it becomes very easy to put the needle in the, the back of the pelvis, which is a really quite a big bit of bone, really soft on the outside, so the, the thick bit of bone, the, the shell of the bone in that position is only, a, it's half a millimetre, it's really, really thin. You go straight into the spongy bone. And so it's really very straightforward and patient in that position. I, I, I will move on, I can tell. <laughs> this is not good. Right, <clears throat> we didn't do that. 
We do take, we aspirate, was the word, to suck with the syringes to aspirate a small amount of the marrow blood, and it looks just like blood, and spread that out on a glass slide, so we call it a, a, a film or a smear. And it's just like looking at a blood film. So on the left might be some of the cells we'd see in a normal marrow biopsy, and you just see lots of different types of purple cells. Now there might be some red cells in the background, we don't look at the red cells, I don't even notice those, the muddy brown red cells, I ignore them, I'm just focusing on the purple cells and the development of the different cells in, in this. So we have some big ones, I think this is a megakaryocyte, going to make some platelets, a lot of these are developing into red cells. This one here is nearly, nearly a neutrophil. So we see the development of all the different cell types in the marrow. And the one on the right is what we would see in myeloma, for example, where most of the cells, or many of the cells, not most, many of the cells are these big plump cells making antibody for our immune system, except they're all the same and they're, they're cancerous. Right, I don't know how long I should spend on this one. And this is a biopsy. So we take the biopsy, the trephine biopsy of the core sample. So I presume most of you have seen this. We usually like to get a couple of centimetres, which is what it looks like on the left. It gets put into a wax block. Well, first of all, it gets pickled, pickled in formalin. And then when it's, and then we need to dissolve the bone out of it, because it's pretty hard to cut slices if it's so we dissolve the bone out of it, put it into a wax block, so that's a paraffin block in the middle, and then cut very, very thin slices of that. We call them sections. I don't know why we call them sections. We should just call them slices. But the really thin slices, three micrometers thick. So you do about 300 sections, 300 slices per millimeter. And that's what we look down through under the microscope. So that's about half the width of a small cell, a small cell, so 7 to 10 micrometres. So on the left is what the marrow looks like down under the microscope. The, what, on the right is what it looks like if it comes out of my barbecue. So I was, I was, no one else would be delighted in the way that I was when I was cleaning my barbecue and saw this piece of lamb chop or, or something. And, I, and it was just beautiful and clean, and so I took out our home Instamatic camera and took a photo of it. But it, but it illustrated in a way that nothing else can do the, the structure of your bone marrow. So you can see we've got this bony network, it's sort of like a honeycomb in a sense, and between the, that bony framework is where all your blood cells are made. And they interact with the bone. The bone's not inert, it's alive and it's giving, um, it's an interaction with the stem cells in the, in the bone marrow. So on the, gets, go, go back to the left. So the, the pink stuff is the bone. So you imagine if you took a slice through, it'd, it'd look like that. And then in between the bone, we've got a mixture of marrow cells and fat cells. So normally, on average, for most of us in the room, it would be a bit less than half of our cells would be bone marrow cells and a bit more than half would be fat cells in, in the back of the pelvis. Okay. If you do a leg bone or something, it'll all be fat. So if you've got leukemia, for example, or, or, or many of the conditions that you might have, then the bone marrow, if it's involved, and it, it, this won't apply to all of you, of course, will be full of the cancerous cells in this case, the leukemic cells. And there's no room for anything else. And of course, that's why you get anemic, because there's not enough room for your red cells to grow. Your neutrophils are low, because there's not enough room for them. And the platelets are low, because there's not enough room for the cells to make platelets. The flip side, maybe you've had your chemo. And on the left-hand side, your marrow might, like, might look like this straight after chemotherapy for, before it recovers. So the one on the left is what we call hypocellular, or very low cellularity, compared to the one on the norm, the normal one on the right. Okay. That is what it might look like if you've got lymphoma in the bone marrow. So it looks different, doesn't it? And that's what we see. Lots of different patterns. So there's a lot of different subtlety within this. Often when we do a bone marrow, we go on and do additional tests. So one of the tests we do is a cytogenetics, or a carrier type, or look at the chromosomes. So they're all the same thing, different words for the same thing. So we particularly do this in the acute leukemias. 
We want to see what's been messed up in the chromosomes that caused this cell to become a bad cell. Just this, this is not about your whole body, it's about the leukemic cell itself. And that, the information can be critically important. Sometimes it just gives you information about what to expect, about prognosis. Sometimes it critically alters management. And a good example would be a translocation, which is where two chromosomes, chromosome 15 and 17, cross over. And they get caught up with each other. It's sort of like you tie in your laces and you tie the two shoes together or something. That's a trick you play on your mates, don't you? Tie the shoes together. And it's sort of happening like that in your chromosomes. So the patterns of your chromosomes can be really useful and really informative in some situations. So what we do, or what the, I don't do, but the clever people who do this do, is grow the cells in the laboratory and stop them exactly about when the cells are about to divide. And that's what they look like. Now they're amazing because they can tell these apart. They can tell every chromosome. Not just that, they can tell what's right and wrong about every chromosome. When I look at that, this is what I see. <laughs> right? They're just like a paddock full of sheep. So. But the cytogeneticists, are, I, I think it's extraordinary what they can do. So they can take those chromosomes as a different pattern here and line them all up. And so that's chromosome one, that's chromosome two. They all look pretty much the same to me, but to them they're, they're as different as we all are. And in this particular case, there's two little red arrows here, at number 15 and number 17, and they say they don't, they don't look right. Not only do they know that they're 15, which I don't know how, but they know that they don't look right. And what's happened here is these two chromosomes, 15, which I've done in green, and 17 in red, have swapped over some of their materials. So part of what should be on chromosome 15 has gone on to chromosome 17 and, and vice versa. So that suggests, if they get that result first, that this patient might have the particular leukaemia, acute promyelocytic leukaemia. But we can't be sure. So one of the tests we often do, and which might have been done for many of you, is what we call FISH. So fluorescent in situ hybridization, it stands for FISH. And for this, we have what we call probes. It's not a very good word, are they? They're bits of... They're chemicals, how about that, that stick onto the DNA in a very specific place. So they stick on where we think those two chromosomes have crossed over. So I've got, on the, on the bottom there, I've got these fluorescent looking probes. So I've got a green probe that's bound onto chromosome 15 and a red one on 17. And when you look at the image on the right, you can see that sometimes the gr there's green one by itself, as it should be, a red one by itself, as it should be. But in many of the cells, there's a, a, a red and a green side by side, and then it's reciprocal partners. See, they're, when they've got that, there's a reciprocal partner side by side. Now, sometimes you'll see that by chance, but if you see that again and again and again, then these, again, these very clever guys say, hold on, we can prove that there's a translocation between those two particular genes. So that's fish. The next thing that's often done is called flow cytometry, or marker studies, or surface markers, or leukemia markers, or something like that. And we use this a lot, especially the leukemias, especially the lymphomas, myeloma, gosh, just about everything, to very, very accurately identify the precise cell type. Now these cells, we had the purple cells before, and I can look down the microscope and get a pretty good idea of what sort of purple cells they are. But I can't tell a B lymphocyte from a T lymphocyte, or I can't tell an early T lymphocyte from a late T lymphocyte, that sort of thing. But these cells have got markers on their surface. They've got proteins on the surface. David talked about some of them yesterday. That was actually superb. And um, they have, they experience they express different things on the surface as they're interacting with the world around them. So, a B cell on the left expresses a thing we call number 19, CD19. And a, a neutrophil here, all those things in the neutrophil series express 33s, and T cells express 3s. And lots and lots, there's hundreds of them, but there's three examples. Now we've got antibodies, so the world has created antibodies against them. 
And so there's an antibody we put in the tube that's against the number 19. We have antibodies against the number 33, and we've got antibodies against the number 3. And on the end of the antibody, we put nice fluorescent labels. So how do we pick those up? They go through a flow cytometer. So the flow cytometer, this is starting to get a bit techy. Flow cytometer is a really fancy machine that has a laser, and it shines a laser at the cell as it's coming through. And that antibody with the fluorescent label will give off a signal and tell the electronics what sort of cell has gone through. And it does this incredibly fast. It can do up to 25,000 cells every second, which is, I think, is, is boggling. Our flow cytometers that we use now pick up about 12 different colours simultaneously. So very, very detailed information about your leukaemias. And we, um, I won't labour this, but we have lots of different um, markers that we use um, and you know, huge numbers to really refine your diagnosis as accurately as we need to, to make sure that you get the right treatment. And that, that process is continuing. To, we're getting better and better at it. So sometimes we do gene tests. I'm not going to talk about gene tests very much, but in some situations, some of the leukemias, some of the lymphomas, um, we, we, do, we target on specific genes and we say we need to test this gene or that gene to give you more information. It's not going to be long before when someone comes in with a leukemia, we just sequence everything. We sequence your entire genome, all the genes. I don't think that's far away. It's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. The computer side is still huge, um, but it's not far away. And so I think we'll get a very big picture of, of what makes your leukemia leukemia. So we put all that information into an integrated report, which is sometimes why the bone marrow report hasn't come back yet, because we're trying to put it all together. And we deliberately hold it back so we can put everything together. So the aspirate, the trephine, um, the flow cytometry, the cytogenetics, and maybe the gene test might all go into one report. Not everybody does it that way, but that's the way we do it. And of course that goes to your, your haematologist or your doctor. One last slide. Um, sometimes we see really pretty things. So this is a patient who had lymphoma, and the lymphoma, he got treated for the lymphoma and just disappeared, melted away. And it left behind these golden balls. Uh, got, it's, a, it's a pigment that's left over from the leftover cells. We don't see it very often. It looks beautiful down the microscope. So I know it's a, you're, you know, you're having a tough time, but somewhere in, in these clouds there's some golden linings, maybe, I don't know.